Welcome to Mary's Eclectic Interests. Today we're at the Minnesota State Fair. We're in the art building along with Supervisor Jim Clark. Can you tell us how many years now have you been Supervisor? Sure. Hi Mary. Uh, I've been Superintendent of the Fight Arts Department here at the State Fair for six years. Are you ever surprised by some of the pieces that come in? I'm totally surprised, uh, many times. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity for all Minnesota artists to participate. Um, and each year we get uh, many entries by artists that have been participating year after year after year. But each and every year we get uh, participants that this is the first time they've ever engaged in any art show, let alone ours. Uh, and this weekend uh, we're bringing in uh, works in the second phase of the jury process. Uh, there's two phases. Uh, the first is a review of, of digital images as they were submitted. We had 2,370 works wow. entered this year in the competition and each and every one of those works is then looked at and evaluated by uh, the eight jurors. There's eight classifications of the competition um, based on media. Um, so from that first group, the 2,300 uh, 70 pieces, uh, we bring a certain proportion in to see in life because that's the best way to um, experience art and certainly to evaluate it. And so this weekend we have uh, about 550 coming in uh, on the second phase. And from those, the works that will be uh, on display will be chosen. Sure. Has, has there been any real um, jump off into a, a new or a different genre? Well, that's a great question, Mary, and artists for as long as, as, as human beings have been trying to express themselves in visual ways, um, artists have been pushing the boundaries and, and envelope of, of, of tools that they might use to express themselves. Um, and certainly we have many works that yet are um, made with traditional media like oil paints or, or bronze sculptures. Um, but one thing that's certainly on our mind and the minds of artists all over the world is, is digital media and, and using new technology to um, communicate and express one's unique view of the world. Um, and that's always a, uh, well, it can be an uncomfortable process, any type of change in a, in a human environment. Um, and particularly in, in art, uh, uh, if, if, you, if you study art and you look back to the advent of, of photography um, and, and how that changed work, um, it, it was, it was a, uh, maybe a slower um, transition into an acceptance. Uh, and even now, uh, in many ways, photography of, of any sort is, is seen uh, through a different lens than uh, a graphite drawing or a, or a pastel painting. Um, so it's on our mind. And, and the first thing that we did, and, and this was before, uh, before I was superintendent, but they opened up uh, photography to digital process work. And for a number of years, um, if, if your work had any type of digital process, that was it was computer, uh, aided or assisted, or, or you use the computer as a tool in any way, it had to be uh, entered in class eight. Um, but recognizing that um, in these times, um, some artists will um, design a sculpture in virtual space in a computer and then print it digitally with a 3D printer, well, that has very little overlap or sympathies to photography. And so um, three years ago, we opened up each and every class to digital process because there are, uh, like I said, the, the 3D printed sculptures. Um, there are photo collages done in Photoshop and then printed a hard copy of that. Um, there are paintings done in, in virtual space, paintings in a, in a computer mm -hmm. that are then printed out and made into a hard copy. Um, and these issues have been uh, a part of the art world, not just in Minnesota or, or locally, but uh, the whole world um, since the 70s and 80s. Uh, Richard Hamilton is one example of an artist that really pioneered using um, digital media. Yeah. After the second phase, 
and everyone will be picking up their artwork that are not being accepted. And then you are going to go through the process of hanging. Yeah. But how big of a staff do you have to help you with all of this? Oh, well, inclusive, pre-fair activities, uh, preparatory um, time, and, and fair time. It's a staff of about 30 uh, people. Um, and, and that is um, required to ensure everyone has a, a positive experience. And that, um, a big part of that is making the artists, the participating artists feel safe about their work being here. We have a lot of people come through our building. It's a wonderful opportunity to engage with, with art. Um, and so we have uh, a, a fair time staff that walks around to remind people that you know, you, you can't touch the art and, and we don't allow food or drink in the building. Um, but pre-fair activities, it's a smaller crew um, and, and we work on, uh, you know, curate, curating the installation of the work, um, placement and, um, and those types of activities. Uh, that's one of my favorite parts of the job because it's, uh, I see it as a creative activity um, with we generally put on display um, between 320 and 330 or so works. That's about the number of works that the building um, holds in, in a way that uh, isn't too scrunched, too cramped. Um, and, and it'd be pretty easy just to put the stuff up where it was, but uh, that's an, that can be an overwhelming number of works for someone to view. And so I really see it as an opportunity to um, curate the experience of the viewer through the space and um, promote engaged viewing by having sympathies and contrasts visually. So we don't have a row of, of all the same sized works or works all framed with the same color frame or all the same subject even, um, because that could be, uh, it could coax or lull a viewer into um, kind of a, a sleepy, lethargic state. You know, you become less engaged and interested in, in each and every work. So that's, that's one of the things I look at when, when curating the installation. And I also know that every year you have an artist showing how to do a particular uh, piece of art. Yeah, so um, the majority of our space is devoted to the results of the juried competition, of which we're in the 105th year of that competition. But we do have a smaller area of the gallery set aside for a special exhibition. And um, for the last five years, that's been the Studio Here program, um, kind of a short-term artist-in-residence situation where we have a different Minnesota artist come in each day of the fair. So there's 12 artists. They work the open hours of our building from 9 in the morning till 9 p.m. So it's 12 hours and it's 12 days of the fair. Um, and we have uh, 12 different artists this year that will be working in a number of different uh, media and, and it should be very exciting. Now we're hoping to come back for the uh, party that you have prior mm -hmm. after everything is hung, everything is done. And this is quite an event for both artists, their family, their friends. Yeah, there is a, there's a, a private opening reception for the um, participating artists and their friends and family. Um, and because we had 2,370 artists participate, and you can imagine then friends and family that um, the, it is packed in here. There's quite a few people. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful event and a, and a celebration of, of Minnesota artists and their participation, um, um, as is really the entire uh, State Fair Fine Arts program. I mean, we, we really look to celebrate Minnesota artists and what they do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. And that's the end of our interview with Jim Clark, and this is Mary from Mary's Eclectic Interest. Hope Uh, we're interviewing Jane McKinley at the Minnesota State Fair, and the title of her artwork is Horses of Another Color. And Jane, can you tell us a little bit about your artwork and what inspired you? Okay. Well, the Horse of Another Color, I do a lot of horses, as you remember. Yes. So I'm doing horses. Okay. 
what inspired you to do this particular horse? I mean, he looks like he's racing for the finish line. I like to do it with his movement. I don't want to have a static horse. And I liked it. I thought it would be fun to do a wild color, so I put wild color on it. And have you ever been at the uh, state fair before? Three years ago, I had a, a horse race, and it sold right away. How many horses? How many horses were in it? Four or five. This is a single one, of course. Yeah. I tried to put a decent price on this one so I could sell it. <laughs> now, we were trying, wondering if you're one of the oldest ones out here. I could be. You want to know, know how old? Your weight, what, in your 80s? 84. Your first one was three years ago, and you were just 81. Right, right. And were you surprised to find out you were back in? I was. I was hoping I would be. I want to be in when I'm 90, if possible. Oh, fabulous. Keep working. How long did you take? Yes. Not very long. Probably half an hour at the most. Your prior piece, you worked on that for a long, long time. That one, yeah, but this is water paint, so it goes faster. Yeah. What do you paint on? Whatever, cardboard, whatever I can do. This one I think is uh, just paper, but I'll paint it in cardboard, whatever I can find. Just the regular cardboard box type cardboard? Sure. You get and a lot of interesting kind of impasto. So do you prime it first or do anything first? Not always. Or you just leave it brown? I can leave it brown. It's a really nice piece. I really like it. I'm glad you like it. Not too I've bright. I've always liked your pieces. I'm glad. <laughs> I like color, obviously. Obviously. We are at the State Fair, and we are going to be interviewing Tom Payne. And Tom, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I've um, tried several times uh, getting into the art show, and I finally made it, and I got fourth place. So I'm really excited about being in the show this year. Now, do you mainly do sculptures? I do. Uh, a majority of my work is steel sculptures like this, ranging in about this size, and all my scales are hand pounded. Uh, they're painted, they're rusted, and then they're screwed onto boards. So it takes me anywhere from 30 to 60 hours working on something like this. And what is your background in the art field? Well, I, I'm a graduate of the University of Wisconsin Stout with a degree in art education. And um, I kind of struggled with my art for a long time, and I'd say in the last five years, I've really decided to, you know, concentrate on my on my sculptures. So it's beginning to pay off. Well, I bet you're really excited then that you're your fourth place. I mean, wow, that's awesome. After, after trying for several years and not getting in, I was I was totally jazzed about getting in, and I just I just launched my new website which is deadfishart.com. So come visit my website to see all my sculptures at deadfishart.com. Tressa Sulars is going to tell us about her fiber piece. And I am going to just let you tell us about it. It's a temporary basket maker for probably 40 years. Years ago I had a serious illness and I could no longer work with uh, rattan, which is what I used to work with. So I, because of some physical limitations, I started working with cotton. So this piece is entitled um, Finale and it was the last piece that I made in a series of 40 pieces that I had at the Textile Center this past March when I had a solo exhibition there. And the thing that was interesting about this particular piece is because most of those pieces were reflective of a reclining body, and the very last piece um, ended up standing on its own, which was very symbolic to us that we made it through a really difficult time, and now we're standing, and I'm doing well. This is cotton. The black is all cotton. The technique that I use is a traditional um, basketry technique called twining. And I don't have to soak the material like I did with rattan. And the red beads here are beads are white hearts. The core of each of the beads has white. So do you attach those after the fact? They're woven right into the right structure. Now, as you go through. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you asked that question because so many people think I go back and stitch them all it on. It almost looks like it, but sure. as you look in, now I can see it. Going yes. Into and they're trade beads. They were used for trade. The really, really old beads were 
Um, these are not as old as some. I have some that I've had for 40 years and they were old when I got them. So. so this is a new technique. When I weave this particular piece, it was flat and I just allow it to tell me where it wants to go. And it started to, to curve on one side and so I just continue to allow that to happen by the tension that I use and the way that I weave it. It's just free form. It's free form, yes. And, it's stay, and it just comes up and I, I thought it looked rather sexual. Thank and, you. And very feminine. Yes, thank you. Is this the first time you've ever been accepted into no. the state fair? Or have no, you? I was here last year. Oh, I i haven't kept track of all the years, but I've been here quite frequently. And, and is there anything else you'd like to add? Not really, nothing that I can think of. But thank you for interviewing me and for showing my work. It's a beautiful piece. Thank you. Hey, Tara, could you introduce yourself sure. and tell us about the awards you've won yep. and also your process, which I found very unique. I also am the board president for Women's Art Resources Minnesota. WARM is the oldest feminist arts organization yep, in the nation, yep, and I've been the board president for several years. Um, and I also uh, am on the board for the Show Gallery in Lower Town, which is a newer gallery, just about a year old. So, um, and this piece is uh, in my primary medium, which is encaustic. Encaustic is an ancient medium that actually predates oil painting. It um, is beeswax damar resin, which is the sap from an Indonesian fir tree, and uh, pigment. And so it goes on hot onto the substrate. So I use like a griddle or a hot palette. And then if you think about the way a candle works, when a candle drips, you know, you can kind of pick off the little pieces. So I use a torch to fuse the layers together so that doesn't happen. And then I um, pull off some pieces with uh, a razor blade. I do a bit of an intaglio process here, which is oil paint that goes into some of these pieces and rubs off. This up here is um, silver point, which is also an ancient medium, which predates um, using graphite or lead to draw, and da Vinci did a lot of that. So there's a ground under here, and this is actually a silver wire that you draw with. And the pieces that are under the encaustic won't tarnish, but these pieces will, so the painting will kind of evolve over time as well. So it's kind of a living piece. If you get close to it, it still smells like beeswax. Can you still smell it? So, um, so that part's kind of cool. First time entered and has won an award. Fabulous. Very exciting. Thank you very Thank much. You. You this, so is, much. this is a very exciting piece Thank you, and know. congratulations. So okay, this is Larry and Larry uh, has done this sculpture called Bridge. First introduce yourself. Okay and uh, explain, I see you have won an award, which is very exciting. And could you explain your piece and how it's made? Certainly. Hi, uh, my name is Larry Ostrom, and I'm a retired art teacher from Cambridge, Minnesota. But um, during uh, my teaching, I continued to work in ceramics, pottery. Um, so I've been doing pottery for probably about uh, maybe 40 some years. And uh, this piece uh, is called Bridge, and uh, it's uh, maybe an allegorical piece. And um, uh, the inspiration, maybe to a certain degree, came from a um, village in Japan. My wife and I lived in Japan for three years, and there's a village called Shiga in Japan where the pieces are uh, not symmetrical. Uh, they're uh, very rough. Uh, in Japanese, you would say zada zada, and there's quartz inside the uh, the piece. Um, I put intentionally put burnout material in there to get the rough texture, and all of the decomposition uh, kind of feel to this thing was intentional. Uh, the uh, valley there was. Uh, supposed to be in contrast with the rough nature and the decompositional kind of quality of the clay. Um, but I had to dry it really slow because it's so thick and if you don't, uh, it would explode a little bit beyond what um, I wanted to if I hadn't let it dry well enough. Um, so it's stoneware, it's fired to about 2300 degrees in a gas kiln. And then later, I refired it and I put gold. This is 
gold on the uh, certain parts of the broken pieces and that had to be refired at a much lower temperature after that. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, not really. Uh, you I'm, uh, yeah, if you go to uh, Larry Ostrom Pottery, um, you can see some of my other work. I uh, actually, more than anything, I do functional uh, stoneware, teapots, vases, and that sort of thing. But every once in a while, I'll venture out into something a little different. So. And is this your first time at the State Fair? Correct. It's uh, my first time at the State Fair. First time I've applied, and I was fortunate enough to get in. So. Congratulations. It's Thank a, you very much. Hey, here we are. We have Good Doggy, and David's going to tell us about his piece. And first, introduce yourself. I'm David Holmes. Uh, I've been living in Minnesota for about 10 years. Before that, we lived in San Francisco. And this is a picture I took when I was living in San Francisco. It's of a doggy diner head from a chain of fast food restaurants they used to have out there uh, that went out of business. But these fiberglass heads are still around town and they're very fun and very popular. Uh, they're sort of the unofficial mascot of San Francisco. And so I took a picture of one, and I thought it would be a fun, colorful image for the State Fair. Um, I actually used a, this acrylic paint, and I mixed in a, uh, an iridescent uh, paint that has sort of a metallic texture to it that you might not be able to see, but it shimmers a little bit, and it looks like the uh, fiberglass paint that they, they used on the original uh, mascot. And I started working on it about three months ago. Uh, that's how long it took me to, to finish it, and I got it done just in time for the fair. So I'm glad it was, it was finished and accepted. Could you tell us a little about your background? Are you an uh, artist by trade? or? Um, I went to art school, but I studied uh, graphic design. I never did any painting. I started painting about 10 years ago, and I eventually ended up doing it full time. So that's what I do now. And... Uh, I have had several pieces in the State Fair uh, in the past. I was lucky enough last year to have a piece that won several awards and uh, sold, so that was a very nice uh, experience. Um, and I'm hoping to replicate that this year. Uh, could you give us uh, your website? Thank you. If, uh, if you'd like to see more of my work or get in touch with me, you can look at my work online at www.homespaint.com, H-O-L-M-E-S-P-A-I-N-T. Annie, can you introduce yourself, and could you describe your piece, how you created it, and the dynamics behind it, or your inspiration? Um, my name is Annie Haney. Um, I'm a painter from St. Paul, Minnesota and I work out of Northeast Minneapolis. Um, my art is concerned about our waters, our local waters, um, specifically the Mississippi River. And so I collect river water and sediment for my work um, and incorporate that into creating these compositions. So um, I pour the sediment over my canvas and then I pour the river water and paint and that creates a pattern which then I paint over the top of to create something like this. Now was this the first time that you have uh, entered the state fair or have you entered prior? Yeah, I was in the state fair last year too. Uh, it was That was my first year and my painting was a totally different series. It was actually purchased within the first three days of the fair, and that was a very humbling moment, very, very cool now to be again represented as one of Minnesota's artists. Real quick, do you have a, a website that people can uh, contact you or, or see what other works you have? Yes, I have a website with um, my current work and uh, works in progress and I do commissions as well. My It's just my name www.annie-haney.com and my last name is H-E-J-N-Y. Thank you very much for allowing us to interview you.
Tricia, can you introduce yourself to our audience and could you tell us a little bit about your piece? Sure, my name is Tricia Schweitzer and I live in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. And I've been a painter for quite some time. I went to school at Moorhead State University for my undergrad and then I went to the University of Minnesota for graduate school. And this particular piece I worked on a few years ago, actually um, 2014 was when I completed the piece. And I really enjoy working with urban landscapes. I've done quite a few over the years. I've done a lot of portrait paintings, but I also really enjoy urban landscapes. And so I, I like to take a look at significant bridges around the Twin Cities area and represent those in an impressionistic way. I guess what I can say about it is I really enjoy incorporating different colors. This kind of came across with a brown theme, but I really do enjoy incorporating a variety of different colors um, to kind of bring out the different contrasts, the different kind of line work that you see within the piece. Now I have to ask you, have you ever submitted another uh, piece to the State Fair before, or is this your very first piece? Yes, I, I did, started three years ago actually. I submitted, the first time I submitted, I got into the second round, but then didn't get in. And then last year I submitted and I didn't get in at all. And then this year it worked out. And just think of all the thousands of people that will be seeing your, your artwork in the next few days. Thank you so much for being on our show. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I'm excited thank for you. you. Thank you. Fred, can you do, introduce yourself to our audience? Oh, to your audience. And oh. tell them about your magnificent sculpture. Uh, my name is Fred Kajlo. Last name is spelled just the way it sounds, H-A-N-S-O-N. And I've been a sculptor for 38 years full-time in wood. It uh, in, is in butternut. It's been bleached here and there, and it's uh, some natural finish and some tinted oils and whatnot in it. Uh, the actual depth at the deepest point, I think, is six and a half inches. Um, it's a style called meso relief portraiture. Uh, as far as I know, I'm the only one that practices it in this particular style. It was glued up and carved as one piece from this depth back in order to get the best grain matches and the tightest joints. This there's a strip here about two inches thick that was glued on to the front. And, and the difficult thing with this mesorelief style is that in order to devote the greatest depth to the most important uh, features, uh, like the face and the hands, you're left to compress the foreground and to try to do it without the viewer's eye objecting. If the viewer's eye object, you've lost. Basically, anytime you have a relief like this, is essentially an enhancement of a linear design. So the most important thing is the linear design. And, but you're, you're critically involved in an orchestration of depth. You're, you're using and reusing that same depth repeatedly. And if you were to simply insert things, it would be easier, but it would, it would thwart tru truly doing your best job as far as orchestrating those depths. A website that, that we can put that you would like to mention where we could see more of your work? My website is virtualrurality.com. That is not reality, but rurality. R U R A L I T Y. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you. And it's getting to the end of the evening, and you're probably our last interview. And I never